the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You do too. Stand your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're a grateful people. Grateful, Father, because we haven't come to hear from a man or woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man or a short man. We haven't come to hear from a black man or a white man or a brown man. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we say this, welcome Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, all the glory and all the honor. How fun this is tonight that we get to hear the word of the Lord and you get to build our hearts to be what you would have us to be. So as you bless us this night with the word of God, Holy Spirit, we would ask that you would bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. Jesus, mighty name of the great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Come on, you don't have to give me a bigger shout than that. Everybody amen. say amen. Now that's bigger. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Raising godly children, let's just talk just for a few moments. If I may, I'm going to just start right off with a verse that's probably the most popular verse in raising children. We use it all the time when we have our baby dedications. Go with me to Proverbs 22. And let's take a look at it together. Some of you are married and have children, want to know what's going on. You, want to, you love your children enough to want to find out the right way of doing things. Some of you are in here tonight. You don't have children. They've grown up. You even may feel bad about where you're at with what you did with the children. They may not have turned out as well as you would like them to have turned out. Well, hold on. You're going to get blessed because you're going to understand how to turn that situation around tonight. We're going to be covering a lot of subjects about, if you will, children. We're going to talk about blended families, what it's like to bring families together that are from different parents and how to deal with that, you know, if they have different moms and different dads called blended families. We're going to talk about what to do when you have more than one sibling that is uh, fighting all the time and have different personalities. We're going to talk about discipline, what the Bible says about discipline. Really don't give a flip what the world says. God knows what he's doing when it comes to raising kids. He's raised billions of them. And uh, not all of them are great. We're going to talk about families and themselves. And we're going to see that even the very first family had a failure inside the first family. So if you feel bad about yourself, stop and th think about Adam and Eve. The first two kids, they had one killed them and another. And so they, they had a messed up family also. And so you're going to see all kinds of areas. We're going to talk about uh, education. We're going to talk about your p participation in the children on a weekly basis. We're going to talk about investment in your children. Very important for a lot of parents. We love our children want to see the best of our children. I'm going to share this verse with you. And as I share the verse with you, I want to explain some things. Sometimes we read a verse like this. And as we read the verse, we just blow right through it without it really stopping and thinking about the verse. So let's take a look at it. Proverbs 22, verse number 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. Let's stop right there. Training up a child is a responsibility of mom and dad. Really is a responsibility. Some of you may have messed up on that part of it, but I'm going to share with you later on how good it can be. Training up should not be left to someone else to train up your children. 70% of a child's education comes from the home. 70%. Who that child is and what that child becomes comes from mom and dad. I love the parents that are so stupid that they make statements like, well, I'll just leave it up to my child. When they grow up, they can make a decision for themselves. What you did is you just turned your children over to the devil. He is not backing off of you, saying, wow, they, they gave up their children until they're mature. I guess I'll leave your children alone until they're mature. 
He doesn't say that at all. He says, man, now that the parents are off of the kids, they are fair prey for me. And he jumps on them and tears them apart in every direction. Never give up in doing the training part. The problem with a lot of people is we train according to the world. Well, you can't train. That word train, the reference here, is that you're going to teach your children what it is to be godly people and Christian people. Even if they don't have a heart for it, you teach them anyway. It's their job to learn and know from their parents. Can I just say this? When you hear this, you've got to understand something. Unless somebody teaches them something, they won't ever have a decision about anything. If you let them make all the decisions, nowhere in the Bible does it say let the children raise the parents. And we have a whole generation that children dictate to parents. The training has got to come from the parent to the child, not the child to the parent. How much of us that are in here allow our kids, because we love our kids, that's, that's normal. We love our children. How much of us, as we, because we love our children, let our children get away with stuff, therefore they're training us and training themselves that they don't have to be trained up in the ways of the Lord. They can stay with their own way and do their own thing. So when the Bible makes a statement, train up the child, he's really saying, there is a way for a child to go. And it's not the way of the world. It's not the way of the flesh. It's not the way of your own individual thinking. I was at a funeral not too long ago, and someone who was a young man died, and the statement is, everybody that got in the pulpit area made this statement. Well, you know, he lived his life his way and what was important to him. And I thought, how sad of a testimony. Do you understand, my friends, that we're not supposed to live our life our way and what's important to us, but we're here to learn how to live his way and what's important to him. This is not about us. This is about him, Jesus. And if we're really Christians, listen to what I'm going to say to you, then we're going to have to be a people that understand that this word training up means they're going to grow up into a place of understanding who they are in Christ Jesus, believing the word of God. Who's going to teach them the word of God? If you have 70% of the influence of a child, then the responsibility of that child comes back to you. And so a lot of times we don't understand how important it is. We just think if we get along, if we'll just get by, if we'll just feed them, and if we go along with society and our social system, and we act like everybody else, then I guess, you know, that's good enough. But the problem with that is, is they'll grow up like the social system that you trained them in. They'll grow up like the television, like they're trained them in. They'll grow up according to what Hollywood says or what the Glamour magazines say or Glamour material says. Instead of having a heart for the things of God, they'll have a heart for the ways of the Lord. All because someone didn't pick up on the first four words of this verse. Train up a child. Our responsibility has got to be training up a child. Oftentimes, is this not true? Our televisions train up our children. I think, I mean, you can say anything you want about me, but, you know, what do I know? I've only raised four kids. They're all in ministry serving God. Somewhere along the way, Deborah and I didn't even know it, did something right. Now that I look back on it, I could see some of the things that we did right. You will find that if you hang around my children, they are different. They're not going to talk like other people. They're not going to drink like other people. They're not going to cuss like other people. Their minds are on the things of God. And if you don't get your things on the things of God, it won't be long before you're not hanging around them very long because they can't handle it. Neither can I tell you the truth. Deborah and I were literally wild about our relationship with God and everything was about training up the children in the ways of the Lord. Television, we allowed it, but we allowed it only certain part, only going a certain way, only a certain amount of time. Only We stopped it somewhere along the line and said, that's enough. And I, In fact, I remember uh, my kids, they laugh about it today, the Smurfs. The Smurfs were little purple people. And Debbie and I were so fanatical about things of God, we thought anything that was purple had to be a demon. And so we wouldn't even let our kids watch the Smurfs. Now they laugh about it and think it's funny 
But you know what? They saw something in mom and dad, a commitment to train up. They knew we were serious about this. Very important. The Bible makes it very clear. Train up a child in the ways he will, that he should go. Notice the word should. And I love the word, didn't say will go. It says should go. Should go means he's got to know this is the right way, this is the wrong way. If there's anything I've seen recently here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center is young people that are coming back to the Lord who were raised here in our grade school, in our junior high time, in our high school, that who grew up, decided not to do church, went out, got married, had a bunch of kids, and now I see them on their knees before the Lord. They have come back home, and that's exactly what's being said up in here, that they should go. They know after they've been trained properly what they should do, and what they, it doesn't mean they're going to do it, but it means, listen to this, they should do it. This is what they should do. Until a child is raised that way, until a child is trained that way, they don't know what they should do. So they ended up with talking to a parent that comes along, and the parent makes a statement that says, you know, well, whatever uh, you want to believe, you go ahead and believe you're old enough to make decisions for yourself. Can I tell you something? I made a decision in my house. You eat my food, you serve my God. And every one of those kids were hungry all the time. And they didn't know where to go. So guess what? They ended up serving God. Before they knew it, that was just part of their life. Today, they serve God with their heart because they were hungry with their bellies at first. <laughs> and so this is the choice you have, guys. In my house, we will serve the Lord. And you say, well, isn't that kind of like, uh, you know, uh, isn't that kind of like hard and harsh? And isn't that kind of like manipulative? You bet. Isn't it hard and harsh that the devil wants to tear your kids apart? Do you ever, can you imagine your children laying on a floor with a, with a needle in their arm like that movie star just recently did with it still stuck in their arm? Come on, guys. This is a hard, harsh world. And you and I, as parents, have got to get tough about how we're going to raise our kids and what we're going to stand for and what we're not going to stand for. Come on, somebody. And let me say this to you. Listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. The devil does not back off because you back off. When you back off, he really backs off. You've got to train them so they know what they should be doing. And then it says these words. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. When he's old, he might depart for it when, when he's young. But then when he's old, he's going to remember what he should be doing. According to God gives you a promise that you should do it. Are you following me? I mean, stop thinking about this just for a second. Sometimes we don't see what the verse really says. It says, when he is old. Can I tell you and ask you a question? Let me just ask you this one question. If it's when he is old, what happened before he got old? And then it comes along and it says that he will not depart from it. In other words, did he depart from it when he was young? Probably, could have, made the wrong should decision. But when he's old, he'll come back. And what's important is them coming back. What's important is not just running the race a certain way. We want people as Christians to run the race a certain way because we want you to prosper. We want you to be successful. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be blessed in every area of your life. So we fight for that here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. We fight for that. We really want you to be successful and blessed in every area of your life. But can I just say something to you? Sometimes uh, you may not live a blessed life because you've made bad choices, but as long as the choice at the end was the right choice, that's what's important is eternal life that's set before you. Come on, somebody. So this, this, this promise that God gives us is truly an amazing promise, but it also takes some responsibility on your part and responsibility on my part. There are some things I want to share with you tonight. Fundamental things that I remember and Deborah remembers, and she'll share some of the fundamental things as she uh, remi uh, reminded by the Spirit of God in her heart. But I know these are the things that we did as parents looking at our children. Uh, we were never, uh, as young people, very successful. We had a very small church. We didn't have any health insurance. We were a lot like a lot of you, didn't have any money, uh, didn't have, you know, vacation. If we had a vacation was 
finding the cheapest hotel in the middle of the desert at summertime next to the uh, Nazis who took the room next door with their motorcycles. And I'll never forget that vacation. We were afraid to breathe that they were going to shoot their guns through the room. I mean, can you guys, do you guys remember that at all? I don't think they remember it. But it, it was, that was our vacation in the middle of the summer. I mean, we're a lot like you guys. We didn't know how to raise up kids. So what we did, we look back now at it and see that we did some things right. And of course, we did some things wrong. I want to share some of the right and wrongs with you right now. First of all, let's talk. The number one thing in raising a child, or running a business, or having a great marriage, or relating with your friends and relatives and relationships and business or whatever it might be, is this great word called faith. I have got to raise my kids in faith. I got to know that God is the one who's going to provide what is needed for my children to be successful. I have to know that. I had to know it in my heart. I had to believe it. Even though at times I wondered about my children, I wondered about what I was doing. Can I just make this statement for a lot of you parents that are out there? We literally did not know if we were good parents or bad parents. And some of you that are out there right now don't know if you were good and don't know if you're bad, don't even know if you are doing the right thing or the wrong thing. You're just doing the best you can at what you have, and that's the way we were. But the best we can with what we have, his name was Jesus. And as little as it was in those days, and as shallow as our relationship was in those days with Jesus, I'm here to tell you it was enough that the word of God solidified us. We had to believe God when the kids didn't have insurance. We had to believe God. Poor Luke one time caught his hands. I was coming to church to preach and slammed the, the door on of the car on his fingers. His fingers were just ripped, uh, not ripped open, but ripped around the car. The door was solid closed with his fingers sticking out. I'm on my way to preach the gospel. I was supposed to be in the pulpit area in the next 45 minutes. What do I do? I had to believe God to heal his hand that was all torn up. And we put his hand out and we said these words, in the name of Jesus, God, we're calling upon you. By your stripes, he's healed. That little guy's hand just straightened out and was completely healed. We came to church and preached the gospel. I'm talking about faith, my friends. Now, when you hear him on the pulpit today and he's preaching to you like this, that's my fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. For those of you that are brand new, uh, he doesn't do that. His, his fingers were just fine. You might say, guy, what a stupid parent. We didn't have any choice. We didn't have any choice. And what we do oftentimes is we live our life according to what we think it ought to be like instead of what God says it ought to be like. I don't know if there was anything broken that day or not. All I cared about was whether or not it was healed, and it was healed. Many times they would cut themselves open. We didn't have money to go, you know, every time uh, our, our kids, our grandkids nowadays, anytime they sneeze over four times, they're there at the doctor and not pecking on you guys, but I just shake my head. And, and uh, you, some of you moms are the same way out there all the time, you know. I, I remember they would cut themselves open and they needed stitches, but not me, man. I put a butterfly thing on there and prayed and uh, they might have a big scar today, but oh, praise God, I got to preach the gospel. And faith was what got Deborah and I through. Faith, faith that God was going to come and touch them. That God was going to protect them. That God was going to take care of them. That God was going to provide what was necessary so that we could keep doing what God would have for us. A lot of times we forget that. And what we do is we look to try to solve the problems ourselves. 
And we're run ragged trying to solve all these family problems and family situations. Instead of bringing it back to God, we run to a doctor. Instead of bringing it back to God, we run to the dentist. Instead of bringing it back to God, we run to this and run to that. Instead of coming back to the place where we sit down and pray together as a husband and wife, praying over the children, believing God. The answer is not what the world says can take place. The answer is what God says. And so if the world says, well, you need to stitch up and stitch up and stitch up or take this medicine, take this medicine, that's fine. But I'm here to say, and I'm not saying, well, listen, my doctor's on the front row, so I'm not saying anything against medicine. But I am here to tell you that oftentimes we go to medicine first instead of God first. And we need to take faith to God first. Let me tell you something. And then go see the doctor. Is that okay, Dr. Kanga? I love you a whole lot, but, you know... I'm going to go to the word first. There's this guy in the Bible had a child. The child meant more to him than anything in the world. He was 100 years old when the child was born. His name was Abraham. His wife was Sarah. Turn with me to Genesis 22nd chapter. Talk about faith. What happens is that this child was so important. For those of you who don't know the story, let me just take you a moment. Give you the illustration of scripture about faith. He hadn't had a child. He has gone childless. There was no inheritance. This was a big deal to him. It was a horrible, horrific experience that his wife had not given him a, a son and hadn't got a child. There was nobody to pass along the lineage to. to. There was no one to pass along the inheritance to. There was nobody to pass along anything to. And in these days, that was a very, very important thing. We find that he finally, God speaks to him when he's like, you know, 90 years old and she's like 80 years old and she has a baby at 90 and he is 100 years old, has a child. It's a miracle in itself, an amazing story in itself of the faithfulness of God, how God can surpass those things that are natural. And God can take whatever situation your child is in, whatever situation you're in as a parent, and God can do the supernatural because he's a supernatural God. But in order for that to happen, you're going to have to call upon the supernatural God. You can't just always run to the natural. You've got to call upon and get involved in the supernatural. Are you following me? And so what we see with this child, his name was Isaac. He grows up, and I would guess he's about 13 years old, and he is the pride of his father and the pride of his mother. I mean, he is the, if you will, the rock star of Abraham's family. He is ultimate in Abraham. Abraham, at 100 years old, is so proud of his child. And then all of a sudden, a day comes when Abraham hears the voice of the Lord about his child, and it's the craziest voice there ever was that spoken to any parent. Let me take you there, if I may, in Genesis 22nd chapter. Verse number one of the 22nd chapter of Genesis. And you might want to take your pen out and get ready to underline some things because these are pretty important for us to see as we're talking about raising our kids with faith. The best thing you can do to raise your child is to be in faith. In verse number one, it says in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, talking about faith. And now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, and whom you love. Don't you know he loved him and was proud of him? Don't you know he was the heartbeat of his daddy? My goodness, a hundred years waiting for this child. They'll carry on the lineage of this family. This is the most important asset that Abraham has is this child Isaac. He says, go to, uh, he says to whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains and which I shall tell you. And I love this in verse number three. And so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. In other words, there's no complaining, there's no nothing. There's just a guy who was following God. 
God had spoken the most bizarre thing to this man. He said, Abraham, take your only son, put him on a fire, cut him open, bleed him, burn him <clears throat> to ashes. That's what a burnt offering is. There's nothing left but ashes. Oh, my goodness, you got to be kidding me. That has to be the devil that was talking. That couldn't possibly, can you imagine God interrupting you in your living room and speaking that to you? You would say, and so would I, that couldn't possibly be God. You know, the difference between you and I and Abraham is Abraham did not know that the God that he served did not accept human sacrifice. We know that today, but he didn't know that. He was the first Hebrew on the land, first believer, he's the first man of faith that ever walked believing God for great things. And I'm here to tell you something. He did not know that the God that he was serving, the God that he worshiped, the God that he's following is a God that did not accept human act sacrifices, but yet they, God asked him to do it. And all of a sudden, here's his child, his future, his destiny, his purpose, his even identity is in the hands of somebody that's going to saddle a donkey with all the sticks and go up to the mountain and they're going to cut him open and then burn him at the stake until a burnt offering and he gets his donkey and he gets ready to go. Can I just tell you something? I would not have done it. And you wouldn't either and you know it. He is so unusual in his relationship with God that he saddles the donkey, does what God says. So Abraham rose in the morning, saddled up his donkey, and he took two of his young men, verse number three, with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood and for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw this place far off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here. Now watch these words, watch these words. Remember he told him, he says, I'm going to, I want you to have a burnt offering with your son. I want you to offer him to me. Now watch what he says here. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, I want you to see this verse number five. And Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkeys. The lad and I are going to go yonder and worship. And we shall, we shall, we will, we will come back to you. Somehow faith was involved. Somehow he knew he was going to that mountain. No matter what happens to that son, God's involved in it, and he and that son are coming back. He knew he was coming back. Notice what it says. And we will come back. In other words, he had a... Listen, you and I have got to have that same feeling with God. We've got to know without a shadow of a doubt that God has our children's best interests, that he cares more about our children than we do, and we have got to put our kids not on an altar to sacrifice them because that's not the way of God. God stops him, of course, wouldn't let him go through with it and provides his own sacrifice. And you'll find as you keep reading the story that God said, man, now I know that you really love me and want to worship me, Abraham. And Abraham gets blessed from that point on because he was really in the middle of a test. God will not test you to that place. Listen to what I'm going to say. He doesn't need to test you with your children, but you do need to trust God with your children like Abraham trusted God with his child. Come on, somebody. And it's called faith. With all of us in here, we're going to raise our children in faith, the greatest tool you will ever use. I don't know, and neither do you, how it's going to turn out with your children. No one knows that. You don't know what God's going to do tomorrow or next week or next year. But if God can provide himself a sacrifice on Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac, God can be your provider too. In fact, when the child asked Abraham, he said, Dad, I see the wood. I see the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, all of the worship instruments. He says, but I don't see the sacrificial lamb. The answer from Abraham to his son is, son, I want you to know that God will provide for himself. You don't know how you're going to make it with your children? Here's how. God will provide for you. you got to remember that. You don't know how you're going to make it in life? God will provide. You don't know how you're going to get the doors open? God will provide. You don't know how you're going to make a way? God is a provider. Come on, somebody. And that's faith. 
Would God have provided if he said no? I don't trust you, God. I don't believe so. Second thing is so important for us to see because we're talking about godly parenting right now. The first one's faith, godly parenting. Second one, diligence. When I use the word diligence, what I'm talking about is this word that is so important for us. It's consistency without compromise. If there's anything that we did at the time is that we were consistent with Jesus without a spirit of compromise. I heard it once said, and it's probably partially true. I don't know if it's completely true that anything that you compromise to keep, you will surely lose. I don't believe that's totally true, but anything you compromise to keep, you will probably lose would be a better statement. And what we do oftentimes with our children is we compromise our relationship with God. Our children just do what we display to them. Let me say that again to you. Our children just do what we display to them. If you are a Republican, you know assuredly they will most likely grow up to be a Republican. If you are a Democrat, most likely they will grow up to be a Democrat. They follow their parents. In fact, if you're a plumber, most likely many of them will be plumbers. If you're a house painter, they'll be in the painting business. They follow their parents. And what we do is we compromise our positions with God. And because we compromise our positions with God, they don't know what to do and they find themselves a mess. And you have got to be like, I know we, you need to be, and you know you need to be, is diligently comp uncompromising and, and consistent consistent in your walk with God. You cannot compromise the things of God and expect your children not to compromise those things also. If you're not diligent with God, they won't be diligent with God. I find parents that are lukewarm with God and compromised with God, may I say this to you, listen to this, or we'll find their children being lukewarm and compromised with God. If one parent is compromised and the other parent isn't, then you'll find half of the children compromised and the half of the children aren't compromised. And you will find that compromise brings death. Literally, lack of commitment and lack of real true relationship with the Lord. I remember as a young man, hearing some pastors talk as a young man, finding out why it was that I was brought up in a denomination that didn't teach the word of God at all. Just put us through ceremonial rituals all my life. And that was frustrating to me when I found out what the Bible said. In fact, it made me so angry. I was just, just livid about how angry I was that I was all those years somebody had not taught me the Bible. And I remember the answer when I went after it and found out why. The word was simply this, we cannot trust the people with the word of God. That the word of God is too deep for them and too harsh for them. And they'll stop coming back to church if you get too deep with them. And I found it's exactly the opposite. Don't play games with me. Tell me the truth. Tell me like it is. I want to know the truth and I want to know the depth. And I was angry when I wasn't told it. And here it was. Let, let's take it a little further. They won't come back to church. If they don't come back to church, someone doesn't have a job. If they don't have a job, they don't have money. And it all boils down to money and a job because they won't come back to church. So they compromise and they tickle the ears of the people. Why? Because they want them to come back to church and they fill them with stuff that's unimportant instead of the word of God, which is very real and very important. And you know what happens? Because they were taught compromise, they become compromised themselves. And now today in the world, we have a complete generation that is so uncompromised that America can no longer make the statement that we are a Christian nation because of compromise. Compromise will kill your kids. And a lot of times we don't see it. 
We think we can just get by just being a nice little old Christian, going to church once in a while. Consistency says, you're not going anywhere. This is our day to serve the Lord. This is a time when you get your Bible and go to, I don't, I don't want to go to youth. You're going anyway. You want to eat my food? That's where you go. But I don't like you too bad. That's where you need to be. In other words, they're needing us to train them. They're not supposed to train us on the way they'll go. Is anybody listening? And oftentimes we do this, we compromise, and we're not diligent at all. We let the kids set the standards for us instead of us setting the standards ourselves. Notice what it says in Proverbs, the fourth chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead. It said, he who has a slack hand becomes poor. And that's exactly the same thing with your children. You have a slack hand with your children when it comes to God, when your relationship with God and your kids' relationship with God will be poor. If you're going to compromise with your children the things of Jesus and you're going to be the one that displays the compromise in your lifestyle, can I say something to you? You will not be happy at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center and you ought to go find a church that won't bother you because this old man's going to get in your face for your kid's sake I will get in your face. Are you following me? Just go and do what you have to do. But this place will not compromise the things of God. That's why we have 3,500 kids every single week in church learning about the things of Jesus. And some of them are more spiritual than their parents. And it ought not to be. Ooh, I'm getting feisty. In 2 Timothy, it says this in the first chapter, verse 16, The Lord grant mercy to the household of Nisbet. For he often refreshed me. In other words, would mercy have come into the house of Onesimus if he, if he didn't say it like this? Because he often refreshed me. Often means he was consistent. Often means he did it over and over and over. The things that Paul was in with his chains didn't bother him. He kept coming to Paul and refreshing him over and over again, even though he was under the pressure of the Roman guard. And here we find him at this place where he was refreshed by this man. And now he brings blessings to this man because of the man's consistency. What if he had only come once? What if he had only come twice? What if parents only come once in a while or when they feel good? Or when there's not an important football game on? When there's uh, some other activity, some sports activity of our children? Let me tell you something. If you want your children to serve God, you're the witness for them to serve God. They'll only do what you do. If you're turned on, they're turned on. If you're lukewarm, they're lukewarm. Somebody listening! It's true. And you're going to have to come to a place of recognizing and realizing this. That it's all about the depth of your heart that's expressed to the depth of their heart. Without that man, you've got compromise. And it's just going to tear the family apart. Last one is love. And I'm talking about mercy and goodness. Love. In other words, you get real religious with your kids. But you've got to hold them in between. You can get real stern with them and say, this is the way we're going to serve God in this family. We're going to pray. We're going to have communion. We're going to uh, love the Lord. We're going to pray together. We're going to read the word together. We're going to have a family night every single week. And as much as they don't like it, can I tell you what they do like? They like mom and dad being there loving on them. My kids didn't care where we went as long as we were together. And that's what a lot of parents think. It's not, it's not the quantity of time, it's the quality of time you spend. When mom and dad are at home, there is nothing better to a child, better than Disneyland. I know we all have season passes, but better than Disneyland. <laughs> they want to be there with their mom and dad. You don't have to spend a lot of money to do that. You just need to be there. And that's where goodness and mercy. Did you know that God raises us up? He's a stern God that demands certain things from us. 
but also there's goodness and mercy that follows us all the days of our life. In other words, he demands us to keep on going and keep on firing up for him and keep on doing him. But he loves us enough to give us some goodness, loves us enough to give us the mercy. We're not so hard and harsh that we break them. We're there to hug them and hold them. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me, I'll never forget. I, my dad did a lot of things in life. But one of the things I remember in life is I remember him holding me and I remember his Pendleton shirts and the smell of his shirts. I remember that to this day and the day that I die. My dad was a dad that never had a dad himself, but he said I was never going to raise my kids. His dad was gone when he was nine years old. He was thrown in the streets of San Francisco at the turn of the last century. Didn't know how to be a father. One thing he did, here's what he did. He extended mercy, and kindness, and goodness, and love. And it's in that love that never fails. Yes, we'll hold up a standard. Yes, we'll not compromise. Yes, we'll, not, we'll be consistent. Yes, we're going to operate in amazing faith. But here's the deal. I'm also going to walk in a love that they know that they're cared for and they know that someone cares about them. And that love is very important, that the dad is home taking care of the kids and mom is there too. And there's nothing wrong with a good arm around them hugging them and loving them. They love to be hugged and held. Listen to how God raises up the great shepherd in the sky in, in uh, Psalms 23, verse number 6. Just pop it up on the overhead. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In other words, God's with us. Goodness and mercy ought to follow your kids from you as it is from God to us. Is anybody listening tonight? Three areas that I want to cover in parenting. One, you're going to parent by faith because you're not going to know how you feel. You're not going to know whether or not you did a good job. Secondly, you're going to have to be diligent and you're going to have to be somebody who's consistent and uncompromised in your stand for God because you're the witness that they read every day. You're the testimony. Now, if you are older, and I love the testimony of older people who did not serve God, but got in and served God with all their heart as they were senior citizens and older, and they won their children to the Lord. Even though, why? Because they were so consistent and uncompromising, even as older people win people to the Lord and their children to the Lord. You'll see that in a minute with Michelle's testimony that we're going to play for you. And then thirdly, we talked about this, love. Love never fails. But it's got to be coupled together with mercy and goodness that follows you as well as follows them all the days of their life. Don't be so hard, harsh taskmaster that you can't put your arm around your child, hug them and love them, and let them know that God loves them and you love them. Because remember, what you do is what they will experience later on. You're the only book kids read. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You know that? You know, I was saying, and I was just thinking about people that are compromised. In this room right now, there are people that are compromised in your relationship with God. You have maybe over the years heard somebody say, it's okay. Now I want to tell you something. That's a lie. It's not okay. And you need to change. But there's an old saying. He that hangs around the mud hole will slide in. Which means that if you hang close and are in a place long enough, it won't be long before you're part of that place and uncompromised. I think a lot of us in our Christian walk, when we first start, are very compromised. I know I was when I started. And I think that if I heard somebody say, if you're compromised, you know, get angry and ugly at me, I would be offended and wouldn't know what to do. But I think you need to understand how truthful it is that you not be compromised. So what do you do about it? Well, you get involved. You meet friends. You don't allow yourself to stay home when you know you need to be in church. You stop coming to church once a week and you start coming to church twice a week. Some of you used to come to church twice a week. 
Some of you only come every other, used to come every service. Now I notice people, now they come once every month. It's just amazing. They used to sit in front and now they're in back. Why? Because they got comfortable in their relationship with God. Never get comfortable in your relationship with God. Fight to always stay close. Don't allow yourself. Hang out all the time. Don't allow yourself to get compromised. It's so easy to get comfortable that you get compromised. compromised. And nothing could be worse because you'll end up a lousy testimony. Some of you have been so compromised that you're really not even saved. You think you know Jesus and you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. I understand that. But did you ever think that the devil knows who Jesus is and he's not going to heaven? So the fact that you have head knowledge about who Jesus is doesn't get you to heaven. We all have head knowledge about it, but it's not about the head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Quite frankly, this is all about the heart. And if you haven't given him all of your heart, you haven't given him all of your life, and that's why I say week after week and all of us that are pastors say the same thing. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing, always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years we've watered that down because we're afraid of the people not coming back. How sad is that? But the truth is, and it's an in-your-face truth. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. You've heard of it. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and you know he is. And then he goes on to say, when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Isn't that funny that he uses the word lukewarm? You know what the word lukewarm is? Little in, little out. You know what that means? Compromised. God is something, but he's not everything. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's compromise. And somebody needs to love you. You may know who Jesus is. Go to church once in a while. You're not against him. You wouldn't fight against him, and you do believe in him in your head, but you haven't yet surrendered all of your heart and life to him. And tonight is your night of salvation. If you're ever going to be the witness for those kids that I'm talking about, you're going to have to give God all of your heart and all of your life. And you've got to stand up for that exact same thing with your kids that you teach them. This is an all or nothing relationship. It's all of your heart. We live for God. Yes, we go party. Yes, we go on vacation. Yes, we build our business. Yes, we buy our houses. Yes, we live and have nice cars. And yes, we do those things. Yes, we work for things, but we live for God. And the building of the kingdom of God. And that's what this is really, my friends, all about. And some of you haven't done that. And you haven't given God all of your heart. You haven't given God all of your life. You know him in your head, but tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium, you can't get to heaven because you're a nice person. There's nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You can't get to heaven because you're good enough to make it to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You would think it would be that way, but it isn't. You can't get to heaven because you say you love God. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. I mean, if you're really going to live your life by God, you're going to have to live your life by what the Bible says. That's the word of God for thousands of years proved itself to be a fact. And if, you, if you're really going to do this, then you're going to have to really give God, you're going to have to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. That's what this is all about. Did you hear me emphasize the word give him? Give him means that he won't steal it from you. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you give it. It's got to be your free will gift to God. It's your heart and your life. And that's what makes you different than everybody else. Nobody forces you to do it. You make the choice. I'm going to give God all of my heart, give God all my life. I'm not going to live a compromised life. I'm going to live one that's fully for God. I've got one life to live. I'm going to live it for God. And tonight is your night of salvation.
You say, well, Pastor, how do I make that commitment? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. Just that simple. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I want to give God all my heart and give God all my life, be born again, headed for heaven. And I'll see your hand go up, and then you put it right back down. It's as simple as that. But tonight, why leave this place the same? You have a future with God that's a blessing. I couldn't ever imagine anybody not wanting to serve God with all of their heart, and want to serve God with all of their life. Tonight is your night of salvation. Don't let anything distract you. Don't let anything disturb you. God's calling you home, and it's your night. Who should raise their hand in a moment? Let me tell you, hold on, we'll do it at the same time. Uh, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know who you are. May you know him in your head. Yeah, you don't have a problem with him being Lord and Savior. But you haven't given him all of your heart. And you haven't given him all of your life. Tonight is your night. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Tonight is your night. We'll do it all at the same time. Hands are already getting ready to go up. I'm going to count to three and pop my hands together. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see it. Put your hand right back down. Is that okay? All across this auditorium. Here it is. I'm counting. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Thank you. Seventeen, eighteen. Thank you. Nineteen. Thank you. God bless you. Twenty, twenty-one. Thank you. God bless you. I got him. Twenty-one. Thank you. Anybody else? There's 21 wise people saying, I'm going for God. And if, oh, all the way back up there, 22, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? On this far side, 22, 23, God bless you in the family room. Anybody else? There's somebody else. I think I got the family room. Thank you, 23. Anybody else real quick? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 23 wise people. Look, no better, no better call than this one. I'm going for God, I'm going to stand uncompromised, I'm giving him all of my heart, giving him all of my life, I'm going to do what he wants, his way, I'm going to learn it, his will, not my want, my way, my will, but his want, his way, his will. All 23 of you that raised your hands, and anybody that should have raised your hand, but you didn't, listen to me, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Get in the aisle, meet me in front right here. We'll all stand, we're gonna welcome you as, they, as you come. But if you're serious about God, you raise your hand, bring a friend if you need to, get your stuff, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. That's all you have to do, just stand up and come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on home. Come on home. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, if you raise your hand, you can come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, we'll wait for you. good well thank god they're still coming but we just want you all to know we're excited about you coming this is a this is a good thing put a smile on your face you're not going to hell you're going to go to heaven Patrick, <laughs> that'll make you happy right there you know we're excited about this i want to point out to you see this guy waving at you over here to my left uh, your left my right his name is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer 
to invite Jesus into your heart. Jesus doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross for you because you need him. Now he comes in because you invite him. He's a gentleman and won't go somewhere unless he's invited to go somewhere. He doesn't push himself on you. So invite him. He'll lead you in that prayer. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature you can take home and find out what to do next. Wow, now that I'm a Christian, what does God want me to do? Well, just read that and you'll find out what to do next. It's going to encourage you to get back to church. That's what it's going to do. Third thing is he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know what that is? That's friends we give away. People that will meet you before church service. They'll talk to you about the Bible, show you four or five interesting things about your life that God sees that you need to know in order to go forward. So get yourself a spiritual personal trainer, a spiritual personal trainer. They'll buy you coffee, tea, nachos. They'll take care of you. Meet you before church service, like 15, 20, 30 minutes before service. And they'll go over some scriptures. By the time you finish, we'll give you a brand new $70 Bible. And you'll have all kinds of gifts that we're going to give you. And then we're going to love on you. And you're going to be solid, strong on the things of Jesus. Listen, we care about you. We're fighting for your soul. Can I just say this? Any other pastor fighting for your soul? This one's fighting for your soul. You ought to make this church your church. We love you and we care about you. Here's what I want you to do. Just make the left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.